Amen. Now turn with me tonight in your Bible to the last book of the Bible. We're going to be turning tonight to the very last chapter. Let me just enlighten you as we turn to the scriptures. Some people have this notion, you see, that preachers just open their Bible and out jumps this wonderful message and they write a few things down and then they just get up and preach it. But I want to tell you those occasions are very, very rare. What usually happens is the Lord gives you a seed thought and you pray about it, you think about it, you leave it with him and ask him to direct and help you. And then over a period of time then the, the text opens up to you. Uh, and some weeks ago the Lord gave me a little text of scripture, at least a few words, come into my mind. And I thought, oh, there's a wonderful text. I've never preached in that before. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll preach in this. And that was maybe four or five Sundays ago. And I'm only getting round to it now. Not because I had other things planned to say other than this. It's that I've been grappling uh, with uh, these particular words and how to develop them. So we're going to read just a few verses. Revelation 22, we'll read from verse 1. Revelation, of course, is a wonderful book. Revelation 22, verse 1. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 7. I would love to read on, but I'll leave that to your own desire and appetite, and I trust and pray the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, my text tonight is taken from Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4, and I want you to think primarily about the first part of the verse, and they shall see his face. I want you to think tonight of the theme, beholding the face of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that I was to conduct a door-to-door -door survey of the inhabitants of Carrie Duff and ask them a series of questions on their doorstep, one of them being, would you like to go to heaven when you die? I'm sure that many of those same inhabitants, probably seven out of ten, maybe even eight or nine out of ten, I believe that they would say, yes, if there's such a place of eternal bliss, a place of joy and happiness, well, well, I would like to go there. Uh, who wouldn't? Now, suppose I asked a follow-up question. Do you know what heaven is like? I'm convinced that the same inhabitants that have answered positively to the first question would answer that they don't know or that they're not sure. I believe that many would refuse to attempt to answer the question. You see, what is heaven like? 
Now let me try and answer that tonight Based on these words And they shall see his face Now let me state this Heaven is a real place I believe that heaven is a real, literal place. See, the Bible speaks of the aerial heavens. That's the sky. That's the place where the birds fly. The Bible talks about the spatial heavens. That's the, the, the other planets, the galaxies beyond our own galaxy, including the sun and the moon and the stars. But the Bible speaks about the third heaven, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Heaven is a real place, a place where God alone dwells in all the glory of the Holy Trinity. Remember the Lord Jesus seeking to comfort his disciples. And in the upper room, he told them there in John's gospel, in John chapter 14, he says to them in the Verses 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is a real place. You see, on life's journey, there's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. Now, that's not airy-fairy teaching. That's not the stuff of legends, young people. That's not something that we want to simply try and get you to make believe uh, as part of the church. That's not just our imagination. There is a place called heaven that's an actual real place. And it's in that place, there's no more sea. There's no more death. There's no undertakers. No news of death's columns in the paper. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more tears. No more pain. No more curse. No more night. No, no more hunger. No more sin. It's a place of many mansions. And I, of course, reject the NIV's rendering of the word mansions for rooms. I believe it's a place of perfect peace and comfort and tranquility. It's a place of joy, unimaginable joy, unspeakable joy. Do you know the Bible talks about that at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore? It's a place of exquisite beauty. Do you know that the walls are made of jasper? Twelve pearly gates that are eternally open. Do you know that the foundation stones, 12 of them, are made of many precious stones? Do you know that the streets there is paved with gold? Do you know there's a river of life there, a tree of life whose fruit um, is uh, for the uh, very um, uh, blessing of the people of God? Isn't, isn't that tremendous? Leaves for the healing of the nations. It's a place, of course, where we're free from sin's presence once and for all. It's a place of great praise. Do you know one of the songs that they sing in heaven is the new song, the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Revelation 5 and 9 uh, it tells us, if you look at that scripture, Revelation 5 and 9, what does John say there? And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? For thou wast slain, that brings us to Calvary, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It's, it's the song of redemption. It's the song of the soul set free. One of the things that we'll be doing in heaven is praising God for the blood sacrifice of Christ. And that brings us again the, the thought of the necessity of the blood sacrifice of Christ. It's a place of eternal rewards. The Bible tells us there in John, um, a Revelation chapter thir 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. You see, tonight if you're in Christ, 
One of the great rewards of being in Christ, one of the benefits of knowing Christ and Savior, is not only that you're accepted in the beloved, not only that you've been adopted into his family, he views you as one of his sons and daughters, not only that you enjoy atonement on the ground of the shed blood, so, so you're at peace with God, you're being reconciled to him, not only have you access to him in prayer, but you also have this benefit of having assurance that one day you will be with him in heaven. Now that's something that the unsaved, the unconverted, the worldly man or woman knows nothing about. There's many in this world, even though they're religious, not redeemed by blood, who have no assurance of heaven. Maybe you're here tonight and you're in Christ and you're struggling with infirmity. Maybe you're trying to cope with sickness and illness. Maybe you face a, a, a disability. And um, I want you to know that your heart and mind is gripped and filled with a lovely assurance that one day you're going to be in heaven with Christ and you'll have a new body like Christ's glorious body. Remember Paul writing to the Philippian church, chapter 1. Verses 23 and verse 24. He told us that he had a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. I want to ask the question, have you that desire tonight? Have you that confidence as a true believer that you recognize that this is one of my blessings that I have of being in Christ that because of that day and time when I receive Christ as Lord and Savior, that I have this assurance that one day I'm going to heaven to be with Christ. This is the holiday time. Many people will look forward to going to uh, maybe a new, beautiful, exotic destination. And when you tell people, because they ask you, well, are you going on holiday? And you might say, yes, well, let's say you're going away to Bali or uh, you're going away to the Maldives, somewhere like that there. And then they'll be asking the second, well, what's it like? And you'll be able to give a description because you have a wee bit of research done. And you'll be able to tell them it's like this or, or, or like that. Well, well, what's heaven like? Twelve pearly gates that are never shut. Foundations that are made of precious stones. A place where there's a river of life. A place where there's a tree of life. Whose fruit and leaves are for the healing of days. A place of mansions. You see, heaven is a real place. But I want to ask another question. What is it that makes heaven, heaven? What is it that makes heaven so special, so beautiful, so, so glorious? Tied into that assurance of going. I want you to think, secondly, not only heaven's a real place, but heaven is a remarkable place. Now, as I've said, let's think to the question. What makes heaven, heaven? What makes it so beautiful, so special, such a glorious place? What is the chief glory of heaven? Is it the pearly gates, the, the foundations of precious stones? Is it the streets of gold, the river of life, the tree of life? No. Here's the answer. Here's what makes heaven heaven. Christ is there. Think of this text. And they shall see his face. You see, the answer tonight to what makes heaven special and beautiful and all glorious is found in a person. Christ is there. They shall see his face. Remember, Paul says that he did a desire to depart and to be with Christ. It wasn't just he had a desire to die and to go to heaven and enter through the pearly gates and walk the streets of gold. No, he was thinking about being with Christ, which for him, he said, was far better. He wasn't taken up with the streets of gold, the tree of life, the river, or the mansion. No, he was taken up with Christ. Remember what we read in John 14, verses 1 to 3? Did, did you pick it up? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. You see, to me, there's the most wonderful 
And best news of all, being taken up with the beauty of the person of Christ. Heaven's the most glorious and beautiful and wonderful place because that's the place where Christ is. That's what I'm saying. It's not only a real place, but it's remarkable because Christ is there. Look at these words. And they shall see his face. Six words. It's a reference to the perfect God, man. Did you notice that there's a conjunction here? And it, it joins up with what he said in the verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. What's it like? It, let's link it up with Revelation 21 and verse Four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You see, the word and is a conjunction, it's a joining word, and it joins up what he said previously, adding to the picture of what heaven is like for the believer. He's saying these things are true. You, you, in Christ, have this assurance of going to this real place. Of, of, of seeing its beauty and delights. Entering through the gate. Seeing the tree of life. Tasting of the water of life. Bringing into mind these no mores. Things that are not found there. And in addition to this. One of the greatest and the best things Here's part of that reward. And they shall see his face. And is important. Notice there's a company here. They, not everyone. We don't believe in that universal teaching that everybody's going to heaven. Archbishop Ramsey in the 1960s, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, said, I believe that atheists will be in heaven. Well, well, well that's a lie. That's not true. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be there. We know that Adam will be there. And Eve, our first parents. We know that Rahab the harlot will be there. Manasseh will be there. Lot will be there. Lazarus will be there. The dying thief will be there. Will, will you be there? Remember at the end of the world, if you look at Revelation chapter 6, just look at the last verse. Verse 16 and 17. It says... And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, now think of that. There's those who are going to meet him in wrath. And rather than meet him, they, they call on the rocks and the mountains to hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. But there's those in this text, and they, it refers to a redeemed people, those in Christ, those who are going to meet him with a welcome and a rejoy. Those have been chosen. They have been called in time. They have been cleansed by the precious blood. They are cared for. They are counseled. They are comforted. Are you in this company tonight? Do you know there's a certainty here? Notice the word, and they shall. No ifs or buts, not, not a maybe. It's not a doubt. You see, maybe you're a believer here tonight, and you're in Christ, and you're, you're thinking to yourself, will I make it home to heaven? I don't deserve to go to heaven. I, I, I sin. I'm guilty of this. I struggle with this temptation and that. I have failed him in many areas. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to make it, Mr. McLaughlin. I want to ask this question. Have you received him by faith as Lord and Savior? Are you in Christ tonight? There was a time when you were without Christ, but a time when you bowed the knee as a sinner and asked him to come into your heart and life and be your Lord and Savior. And if you're in Christ and you're living for Christ through the strength of Christ, then what I'm saying is you also have this assurance, even though it may be faint, 
even though it may be weak at times, but that assurance is there that one day you're going to be with Christ. Turn over there in your Bible to um, John chapter 17. Underline this verse, John chapter 17. The Lord Jesus is in prayer. It's known as the high priestly prayer. I would encourage you to read it. But this is what he said in verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, notice these words, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And what I'm saying tonight, that ought to be a tremendous encouragement Maybe you're here and you've lost loved ones to death in recent days. Your loved ones died well, they died in Christ. And your loved ones are now in heaven. And the moment your loved ones died and breathed their last and their soul and spirit went into the presence of the Lord, that high priestly prayer of Christ was fulfilled that they might be with me where I am. Where is Christ? Christ is in heaven. And where is his people? They're also in heaven. Do you know he knows your name tonight? He's counted the very hairs of your head. He, he thinks of you continually. He has you not only in his heart, but on his mind. And he's praying for you and me right now. He said to his father that they may be with me where I am. And everyone who dies in Christ and enters heaven is the fulfillment of that prayer. Notice also in the text, if you look at it very carefully, there's not only a conjunction and a company, there's not only a certainty, but there's also a character. They shall see his face. His refers to Christ, the Lamb of God. It says in verse 3, And of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. You see, it's a direct reference to the Lamb, the Lamb of God. The Lamb glorified, not the face of an angel, nor an archangel, a seraphim or cherubim, not even the face of a saint, but the face of Christ. Now, what does the face of Christ look like? I don't know. There is no pictures of Christ. What we could get at best is an artist's impression, but we don't really know whether the artist's impression is accurate or not. How does anyone know what the face of Christ looks like? Some people have imagined that they've seen images of the face of Christ in trees. Did you know that one woman who worked in a pub for 12 years was scrubbing the floor one day and she seen this mysterious mark that she claimed was the image of Christ and flocks of people then started attending the pub and drinking beer and looking down at this image of the face of Christ. Someone else who woke up from a drunken stupor who had left some stuff in the frying pan, don't know if it was an Ulster fry or what sort of fry it was, but the fry got burnt. And when he looked into the face of the pan at the bottom of it, he believed he saw the face of Christ. And of course, he took the pan along in a bag to the vicar to show the vicar the, the face of Christ. So it's all nonsense. Isn't it amazing that those who claim to have seen physically the face of Christ in a tree or a pub floor or a frying pan, they don't love him. And we have never seen him. We don't know what he looks like physically with, with the literal eye. And yet tonight, even though we haven't seen him, yet we love him and we're full of joy, the joy of Christ, the, the joy that's in our soul, joy that's unspeakable. There's a character here, the lamb. Notice there's a countenance here. Face. Do you know the word face is mentioned 445 times in the Bible? I want you to know this, that there's a number of characters in the Bible that mention seeing the face of Christ. Can I encourage you to turn to them, just, just to read the passages? Remember what Job said? Job 19, verse 25. Listen to these words. Job was a man, of course, who knew about illness and bodily infirmity. He said this in verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, 
whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. You see, think of that. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand upon the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, he was thinking about dying and thinking of going into the grave. Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Again, think of what David said in uh, Psalm um, 17 and verse 15. Listen to these words. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. There's a countenance here. The hope and certainty of Job. The hope and certainty of the psalmist. Did you know there's a clarity here? It says, and they shall see his face. You know what the word see means? It means to gaze. Not just out of the corner of your eye. Not, not just over the top of a crowd where, where you're uh, seeing the, the uh, top of someone's head. It, it's, it's not just a, a glance or a fleeting look. The word see means an intimate, clear look. A, a continual look. A, 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 a central look. It's, it's a look that desires more and a deeper and a better knowledge of him. It's, it's a look that speaks of a, being in, an intimate relationship with him. It's a look that speaks of having a continual personal meeting with him. And here it is in the text. Heaven's a remarkable place. Not only real, but why? Here's the answer. Because... It's written, and they shall see his face. And to me, that's the best and greatest reward of heaven. I want you to think of this as we close. Heaven is a rewarding place. And they shall see his face. Isn't it amazing in these final two chapters where John the Apostle is inspired to speak and deal with the glories of heaven, Bring to our mind what it's going to be like to experience and enjoy the paradise of God. What is the greatest reward for the Christian? The answer is seeing his face, beholding the face of Christ. Is this not because of a past look? Was there not a day and a time when you look by faith to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? You're, you're now a blood-bought, spirit-born child of God. You're, you're now in a vital, personal relationship with Christ. I, I could ask the question tonight. Was there a day, a time in your life when you've seen the face of Jesus Christ by faith? And you sensed your need of him? And you felt and owned your sin and you were conscious of that. And you discovered, I need to repent. I, I need to get right with God. I need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And, and you discovered then this tremendous message. There's life for a look at the crucified one. There's life at this moment for thee. What a day. A day to remember. A day when I had a past look to Christ. See, you'll remember that. John Newton said, I saw one hanging on a tree. In agonies and blood, who fixed his loving eyes in me as near his cross I stood. Are you saved tonight by looking to Christ? Not the church that saves, it's Christ. Saved by good looks. One of the looks is looking to Christ. Is not what happened to Spurgeon, the great? Baptist preacher, young man of 16. He was going to church. He had a burden in his soul. He could write with God. He felt he needed to do something. He felt, well, I've got to perform certain works and I've got to do this and that. And he, he because of this snowstorm, was diverted down a, a, a side street and went into this little uh, Methodist place. There was only 12 or 15 people. The preacher didn't even turn up that day. It, it was a, a lay preacher. And he hadn't much to say. 
His text was Isaiah 45 and 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. And as he was preaching that and repeating the words, he looked at Spurgeon. He says, young man, you look very miserable. And you look down. He says, I have advice for you. If you're not a Christian and want to be saved, Jesus said, look unto me and be ye saved. And Spurgeon testified that that very text warmed his heart. At that moment in that wee Methodist chapel in that side street, he looked to Christ. He looked by faith. And isn't that our chief concern? That men and women, boys and girls and young people will look to Christ by faith and testify that they're saved by the grace of God. A past look. But I want you to think of a present look. You see, I believe that the true child of God should and must and will look to Christ every day for grace and strength and help. How do we live the Christian life? Remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I want to ask tonight, are you looking to Christ right now? Do you look to Christ every day? See, maybe you're here and you have trials and troubles in your life. Maybe your life's full of problems. You have loads of pressures. You're thinking of this sin. And and you feel this shortcoming and and this folly and this failure. Remember Isaiah 6 and 1, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Remember the prayer of the Greeks? We would see Jesus. And you see, a present look to Christ, I believe, is a foretaste of heaven. Continually looking to Christ by faith, getting glimpses of him. To me, those are precious moments. And and that's something that should happen to us when we come to the house of God. Who is he? What's he like? What has he done? What's he saying to me right now? And of course, I believe that's one of the great needs of the church in our day. That's one of the great needs of God's people is to have a renewed spiritual vision and a fresh glimpse of Christ. Christ tonight is worthy of your gaze, but I'm asking, are you looking presently to him? Do you experience that present look day by day? Where are your eyes tonight? Is it on worldly affairs? Is it constantly in the television? Is it constantly in maybe looking at your bank balance to see how much more money you can make? Maybe it's to do with work and family and home life. I know that we need to look out for the souls of men and women and children. I know we need to look to the fields that are white and ready to harvest. I know that we need to live in light of the last judgment to come, the great white throne judgment. I know we need to live in light of the judgment seat of Christ. I know we need to live in light of looking for the Lord's return. And there's a promise to those that look to the Lord's return. But we're never going to look in those places or think upon those things until our eyes are especially on Christ. Because it's his coming. Because it's his harvest. Because it's his work. Because it's his judgment seat. And you see, looking to Christ strengthens us. Looking to Christ helps us and encourages us. But there's also a promising look. It says in our text, and they shall see his face. And I want to ask another question. Will you see his face? Will you be like David? Will you be like Job? What about your loved ones who have passed into the near presence of the Lord? Friends and family are already there. And whose smile was the first to welcome them home? I believe it was Christ. The smiling, shining face of the Savior. They shall see his face. Will his smile be the first to welcome you home to heaven? Let me just close. Over there in the book of Matthew, in Matthew we read these words. In verse 67, Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hand. 
Do you know who spat in his face? The chief priests, the elders, the co-religionists of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes. You think of the face of Christ covered with spittles. Do you know, was that not a sign of great shame? Is that not a sign of great disrespect and dishonor? Is that not a sign of refusal and rejection? Spitting on his face. Will you see the shining of his face? Or will you be like these co-religionists and spit on his face? It's only a question that you can answer. And if you're spitting on his face tonight, it shows the contempt and the rejection and the shame that you have in regard as person and work. What about you tonight? Here's a little text of scripture that about four weeks ago or five came into my mind and they shall see his face. I said, Lord, how am I going to deal with that subject? And slowly, bit by bit, it opened up. Tell them heaven's a real place. But it's a remarkable place. And here's the best news of all. Christ is there. And they can have a past look. They can know a present look. But they can have this promised look. It's guaranteed. And they shall see his face. Will you see his face? Will you come to die? When you leave this scene of time, you could die unexpectedly. So could I. The Bible tells us, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Why? Because not only do they go to heaven, but they shall see his face. His smile will be the first to welcome them home. May the Lord take these few thoughts and bless them to you tonight.